Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes is a really awesome teaser that isn't worth its price of admission. Here's why. With MGS5 being the final MGS game by Kojima Productions, Kojima set out on creating a whole new kind of MGS experience for his last hurrah. Like MGS4 and Peace Walker, MGS5 has been streamlined to feel more like a Western video game, just way more intuitively designed, responsive, and organic feeling than any third-person shooter before it. Everything that worked about its predecessors is still present, but without the sluggish baggage, and some added intuitiveness to make everything play infinitely better. Movement feels incredibly smooth thanks to the beautifully fluid animation that runs at a glorious 60 frames per second, there's immediacy to most actions you perform, the role has been replaced with a swan dive making it more useful in the heated gunfight, and gunplay is as good as it's ever been with MGS. Largely because there's no more sluggishness in aiming, but mostly because of the enemies and locations themselves, more on that later. Instead of the usual three-hit combo, you get a beatdown animation that looks pretty cool, and as just one tool in your arsenal for non-lethal combat, it gets the job done and feels better than ever. But shaking up the foundation meant more than improving the controls. It also meant taking the established gameplay model of Metal Gear Solid and flipping it on its head. Up until this point, every MGS game has had the exact same mission model. Go from A to B. Occasionally there are bosses, puzzles, or set pieces along the way, but those are all always obstacles to make getting from A to B trickier. Whatever actual objectives the characters had, you, the player, had no direct involvement in. Well, kiss that model goodbye, because with MGS5, when you, the player, are given the task, it's on you to actually see it through, not just letting it play out via cutscene. Your goal is to get in, carry out your objective, and get out. How you get from A to B, what order you do things in, that's all up to you. With Ground Zeroes being the teaser of MGS5, it showcases the bulk of MGS5's mission types. Rescue missions. These are missions where a target is being held captive and your objective is to get them out. In the case of Ground Zeroes, you have two missions like this. The titular Ground Zeroes mission, where you rescue Chiku and Paz, and rescue the Intel agent. The latter of which plays out like a big rail shooter. Oh hey, let's not have a boss fight with the main villain because revenge shouldn't be satisfying, even if I have an entire fucking epilogue to make that point. That's brilliant, you fucking hack! Elimination Missions These are missions where your target is to eliminate a target roaming in the area. In this case, it's Eliminate the Renegades, where you have two war criminals, Glaz and Blitz, in need of killing. Demolition Missions You get in and destroy structures or vehicles. And destroy the anti-air defenses, you do both. Retrieval Missions This is where you recover an item somewhere in any given outpost, then bail. For Ground Zeroes, it's recovered a secret recording. Then finally, you have Miscellaneous Missions. These missions don't fall under any of the missions above. For Ground Zeroes, those missions include Deja Vu, where you recreate scenes from MGS1, and Raiden's mission, where you eliminate body snatchers and then fight off a whole swarm of them to defend Morpho. And all of these missions take place within the US Marine-run Camp Omega, Metal Gear's own Guantanamo Bay. When people think of level design in Metal Gear, their first go-to strength is atmosphere. But very seldom is the actual structural level design anything to write home about. Levels are often too bare bones or too set on one specific linear path to be particularly stimulating. Well, that changed in a hurry when MGS5 came along. Camp Omega is a vast outpost that, in practical terms, is basically a dozen classic MGS corridors condensed into a singular, seamless environment. It's a tightly designed outpost with tons of structural and environmental cover, and a number of paths to any one point of interest. The outpost is designed not only to accommodate any playstyle you prefer, but because of its tight yet open design, you're never limited to a singular fixed route the way you tend to be with most MGS games. It's that marriage of Camp Omega's impeccable level design and each mission's open objectives that gives the gameplay model of MGS5 so much more life compared to past games. Now there's an actual strategic element for how you're going to get someone out of dodge or eliminate a target. You get to consider infiltration points, escape routes, how you deal with or bypass guards, or what methods you'll pick to take down targets or destroy structures. Ground Zeroes and MGS5 as a whole does an excellent job of making me feel like an active participant every step of the way. And I love even more how you can fuck up and not feel like you fucked up, since MGS5 implements an emergent game design that adapts with the actions of the player. More importantly, MGS5 has enemy soldiers that actually possess a degree of self-preservation in conflict. With the exception of MGS3, getting caught was either supposed to be a penalty, or else the guards were too damn dense to be fun to fight. But with Ground Zeroes, Koji Pro found the right balance of challenging yet manageable. Things certainly heat up when guards get into the action, but you have the means to fight back. Not just with your weapons, but with ground placement weapons, tanks, explosive fuel drums, the works. In contrast to MGS4 and Peace Walker, guards stick to cover, get liberal with explosives that kill you in one hit, they'll bum rush you, and have a large amount of backup to plow through before you can end up calling it clear. So if you take them head on, it feels challenging without feeling impossible or frustrating, and that in turn makes it feel fun when you fuck up and either punch through the bad guys or deal with just enough enemies to go run and hide. 
Plus, the better you rank with each mission, the more advanced weapons you get to pick and choose from at the start of any mission. And all of them serve to make your job easier and open more windows of opportunity. No part of Camp Omega goes wasted. Each corridor has a distinct purpose. Sometimes there's weapons or ammo to be found, other times you have prisoners to rescue, or maybe there's a cassette tape to find or secret XOF patches that unlock the two bonus missions. On a mechanical level, I have next to no complaints whatsoever. There is some stiffness, mind you. Rolling can be fidgety, the dive has a sluggish delay, so if you're going from diving to shooting, it can be a little tricky. There's no access to hiding spots like dumpsters or closets to hide bodies. Rescuing targets by getting them to the LZ is fine, but having to carry a bunch of soldiers off to a singular spot gets really tedious. Guns are a bit too weak during a shootout as well, and first-person view aim, things feel a wee bit too loose. And while the guards themselves are an immense improvement over the last few games, there's also zero variety. All guards function the exact same way. No variation in weapons, gear, none of that. Which wouldn't be a big deal if this were just one level in a larger game, only, well, that's kind of the problem, isn't it? This isn't really a prologue to MGS5. It's the intro, the very first mission snipped out, fitted with six nearly identical filler missions that sold at launch for $29.99 after being knocked down from $39.99, a mere 20 bucks less than the full fucking game. Look, the price issue has been talked about to death, I get that. I'm not here to say that Ground Zeroes is a massive ripoff because you can beat the main mission in an hour flat and knock every other mission out in an hour and a half. The problem isn't the length, quality, or quantity. No, it's the context. For the sake of argument, let's say that Ground Zeroes is a game you could knock out in about 3 or so hours. Well, when you skip cutscenes, you can clear out MGS3 in the exact same time. But MGS3 is 3 hours of constantly changing environments, additional mechanics, weapons, enemy types, set pieces popping up, some of them actually pretty good, and 10 boss fights, 8 of which are phenomenal. MGS3 offers a complete and mostly engaging experience where in 3-4 to four hours, you get more or less everything you could possibly want out of a stealth action game. Ground Zeroes, meanwhile, has one really good mission, and six other missions that all take place in the exact same setting with the exact same guards that, minus the actual part where you carry out your objective, play out almost identically to the main Ground Zeroes mission. It doesn't matter how brilliant your level design is. A few new scripted sequences and a different objective isn't going to change the broad strokes of any one mission. You're still in Camp Omega, sneaking around the same marines in the same setting with the same escape routes and tactics. That approach only works if the core content the game has to offer provides enough variation that you can afford to recycle your settings like MGS2 and Peace Walker did. But Ground Zeroes doesn't do that. It has one mission and just calls it a day. And as the good lord once said, that's some fucking bullshit right there, dog. If Ground Zeroes was going to be sold for half the price of the Phantom Pain, then it needed to actually offer a full-on 3-4 to four hour unique experience. It needed multiple outposts to house its additional missions, even if they're smaller. It at least means you aren't sneaking around the exact same corridors again and again, making fatigue that much quicker to set in. It needed to at least feel like it had a proper 3-act beginning, middle, and end. Hell, maybe Camp Omega could have had a commander that could have been the game's solitary boss fight. It didn't need to be a full game, but it needed to at least provide enough content to justify such an inflated price tag, and Ground Zeroes most certainly does not. And I've heard people say, well, that's time, development, and money being taken away from the full game, then. And to those people, I say, look, if Far Cry can give any asshole the tools to create missions with unique outposts using pre-existing assets, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever the same could be done here with the much more intuitive Fox engine. Another common defense I've heard is that, well, look at how many different ways a mission can play out. You can play and replay Ground Zeroes again and again and again and have different experiences each time. Yes, Ground Zeroes' open-ended objectives and open level design does result in a very replayable mission. That's hours of game time you can sink into that mission right there alone. You know what else makes something replayable? Being enjoyable. For the most part, Snake Eater HD is a very entertaining video game. Over the span of 8 years, I've replayed this game time and time again, not because it's highly open-ended, but because the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is so good and everything mostly moves at such a brisk pace that the experience is just a bundle of fun. Being open-ended and giving the players the freedom to tackle missions any number of ways, that's certainly going to help give the game some replay value, but that doesn't mean jack shit if there isn't enough content to create a full and satisfying experience. Now, you might say, well, what do you expect? It's only 30 bucks. Well, you expect a full experience with that? And my answer to that is, yes, yes I do. The Spider-Man City That Never Sleeps DLC in total cost $24.99. It tells a smaller scale but ultimately complete story with a satisfying beginning, middle, and end, with actual character arcs. It has around a 3-4 to four hour long campaign with hours of extra content, multiple costumes, and 5 additional boss fights, 3 of which are really good. Ground Zeroes, meanwhile, is essentially just a pilot, the very first episode designed to sell the audience on the full game. Only most TV pilots don't cost half the price of a full box set. As of today, Ground Zeroes is available on Steam for $19.99. The Phantom Pain, the full MGS5 experience, is also listed at $19.99. 
That doesn't seem kind of bananas to anybody else. Konami did everything in their efforts to make Ground Zero seem like it was engorged with content. From all the trials and records, the hard variations, but none of that changes the fact that everything you do involves sneaking around a single base with next to no variation. It's not even that the missions are bad. I enjoy three of Ground Zero's missions quite a bit. But the tape mission, there's just nothing to it that makes it feel any more distinct than the Renegade to Ground Zero's mission. If you followed my reviews by now, you know that I don't like rail shooters, so the elongated rail shooter chase where I'm just firing a grenade launcher over and over and over isn't particularly exciting. Deja Vu was a cool novelty, but like most novelty moments in Metal Gear had immediate diminishing returns. And once I already knew where all the memories were, what else did the mission have going for it in any subsequent replay? And finally, the Raiden mission. It had a great premise and a great first half, but it completely dropped the ball by turning the second half into a lame tower defense. So out of a seven mission game where six missions all feel like a slight variation of one mission, I only really liked three of them. I didn't dislike any missions, but the other four just don't do it for me. So a game priding itself on replay value only has three missions to carry that mantle. And even the most versatile of missions is gonna start feeling like a lot of been there, done that when it's literally all the game has to offer. And if that wasn't bad enough, the story, or rather the setup to the story, is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> they played us like a damn piano. The premise is that it's been a year since the events of Peace Walker. The world governments are all growing nervous that Big Boss's army, Militaire Sans Frontières, is becoming more powerful. So presumably, the UN sends a nuclear inspection team to check out MSF and make sure everything's on the up and up. Around that same time, Paz, a sleeper agent of Peace Walker, turns up alive at an American black site. And Chico, Big Boss's first child soldier, goes off on his own to rescue Paz, only to get himself captured because it kinda sucks. So Big Boss sets out to rescue Chico and Paz, but the whole thing turns out to be a giant smokescreen, and with Big Boss away, the presumed inspection team revealed to be XOF, Cypher Strike Force led by Skullface, a Cypher agent gone rogue, obliterates MSF. And by the time Big Boss returns to save Kaz, Paz reveals she's got a bomb cooch, explodes, brings Big Boss's chopper down, and puts Big Boss in a coma. And... roll credits. As far as setups go, it's probably the best opener of any Metal Gear game. It's very straightforward and to the point, effectively establishes the main villain as a cunning threat, and shows what's at stake with minimal to no exposition or monologues. Before I get into it, I want to talk about what I like about Ground Zero's writing and cutscenes. First and foremost, Intrigue. Ground Zeroes is one of the best MGS games when it comes to building intrigue, and it manages to do a lot of that in-game for once. All throughout your time venturing through Camp Omega, you occasionally hear snippets of conversations between guards to shed light on Skullface, his unit, and what's been going on at the base. Depending on the areas you venture, you get different radio snippets from Cause, which shed fertile light on things you might have missed the first time around. And the order in which you rescue your targets can lead to different scenarios, like secret recordings not being destroyed and made accessible for the player, all that jazz. There's a lot that really leaves you asking, what the hell is going on at Camp Omega? The side-ups themselves are really good at building up mysteries as well, a few of which even have multiple endings depending on your actions at the end of each mission. Unfortunately, the drawback to these missions being pseudo-historical recreations is that not a single one of them is canon, so who gives a shit when the mysteries themselves have no payoff whatsoever. That's what I mean when I say this game needed to have more than this. It needed every mission actually tying to the main story, expanding on what's going on little by little. It certainly wouldn't have hurt things one bit, but whatever. All of his cutscenes, like many films of the time, are done in one-shot takes, and honestly, I really dig that. There's a seamlessness to the transitions where you get a lot of coverage and awesome transitions without a single cutaway, and I thought that was fucking phenomenal. Is it a gimmick? Sure. Does it enhance the story one bit? No. But gimmick or not, it certainly gives MGS5's cutscenes the sort of visual flair lacking in most big budget AAA titles, which all tend to use a lot of binary, bare basic cinematography. Say what you will about Kojima as a writer, when it comes to his cutscenes they remain cream of the crop. The name of the game here is Subtlety. The commentary on human rights violations at our American prison camps being as real and brutal as ever, that's good stuff. Or how everything is just so business as usual for Big Boss's time around. At first glance, Big Boss's actions are likely to go over your head. Like how his go-to solution for finding out Paz is still alive is to break into Camp Omega and just straight up take her out. The fact that you can kill as many US Marines as you like without any impunity. And especially the inspection itself. Huey might be the one who ultimately agreed to do it, but Big Boss and Cause are the ones who created cover story to throw the UN off their trail. Big Boss went from let's hold on to this nuke for now, to actively deceiving the governments of the world to cover up the fact that he not only has a nuke, but a means to launch it. Think about it. From any other perspective, there's no way Big Boss comes out of this looking like the good guy anymore. He's not an outright villain, but that gray area has been chucked out the fucking window. Again, Big Boss's turn into a demon is not a light switch moment. It's been gradually happening right before our very eyes. And I do give Kojima props for that. And finally, there's Skullface. Ground Zeroes does a great job of establishing what an expert strategist he is. Contrary to most villains who just try to overpower Big Boss, Skullface succeeds in outsmarting him. He pulls all sorts of convoluted yet ultimately interesting strings to get Big Boss and the others playing to his tune, then wipes them all out in one swoop. 
And all throughout our replays with Ground Zeroes' missions, we steadily unlock all of Chico's secret tapes to hear just how Skullface managed to break these two and get them to do exactly as he wished. Skullface is trying to establish a new world order, and to do that, the old world, Big Boss, Zero, Cypher, MSF, it all needs to go. So why is it that by the time the credits rolled, the only thing that exited my mouth was... Well, that's it? Well, for one, this all works wonders as an opening to a video game. It does not work, however, as a full-fledged experience. The whole thing feels like a singular chunk of a much, much larger game because it fucking is. That's the drawback to only having one mission and six disconnected filler missions that don't go anywhere. It not only means that the journey itself is more of an outing gone wrong than a full-fledged journey, but with the exception of Skullface and his prisoners, it also doesn't give our characters a chance to shine, especially not Big Boss. He doesn't have a single interesting character moment besides the general shittiness of his self-interest. None of that dorky personality, no moments of self-reflection or doubt, no sense of tribulation, not even a single bit of interesting dialogue. As the opener to Kiefer Sutherland's take on the character, Ground Zeroes did him no favors whatsoever, because the game didn't give him anything to work with. Even that opening falls back on the exact same problem as most back and forth scenes between the Metal Gear protagonist and supporting character. Minus one or two lines, if you cut out the vast majority of Big Boss's dialogue in that scene, nothing is changed. That's how little his dialogue actually matters here. Ten days ago, we got reports that Pass was still alive. She was rescued by a Belizean fisherman who found her drifting in the Caribbean. So what's the plan? Silence her before we're compromised? No. I've got something else in mind. Our friends at Cypher suspect Pass could be a double agent. She's being held for interrogation at a camp on the southern tip of Cuba. The upcoming inspection of Mother Base has to be connected somehow. The timing's too perfect. My guess is they're trying to corroborate Pass's leak. Word of our capabilities gets out, and we'll have the whole world out to shut us down. Having an American private intelligence agency involved is bad news. Cypher's the ones who sent Paz to us in the first place. If she's still alive, we need her on our side. Ground Zeroes was also promised to be Kojima's darkest Metal Gear game yet. And I kind of have to wonder if that wasn't a tad misguided, because the end result is a really great bit of stealth action that resembles Metal Gear about as much as my ass resembles modern art. Gone is the goofy, quirky personalities that give MGS its charm. Gone is any sense of endearment in any of the fucking characters, or anything that made the other games, badly written as most MGS games tend to be, at least quirky enough to be endearing. Skullface himself is literally the only element to Ground Zeroes that feels even remotely like classic Metal Gear. He's a theatrical villain who loves the sound of his own voice and, like his predecessors, wouldn't look out of place as a Batman villain. But with everything else so dark and ugly, Skullface himself almost feels out of place. You have this very real prison camp full of human rights violations with a shady paramilitary unit overseeing the whole operation, then BAM! Here's a fucking zombie with a cowboy costume. I mean, with everything else being so uncharacteristically straight-faced, Skullface in his ridiculous costume with all his flamboyance just doesn't fit in with the rest of this shit. Skullface either should have looked like an actual serious commander, or, more realistically, the rest of the game around him should have actually felt like a proper Metal Gear game. Because as is, take away the mullet and eye patch, and I have no problem believing this is a Splinter Cell game for as little as it actually resembles MGS. Look no further than the way this game handles, or rather mishandles, its taboo. The first and most obvious is Paz's surgery and Jesus H fucking bat shit. Gratuitous doesn't even begin to describe this fucking scene. First of all, this is hands down the most gruesome, graphic scene in all of Metal Gear and they really want to throw that shit in your face. But did Metal Gear need to go into fetishistic gore territory? Because think about the context of this scene. Skullface has essentially turned Paz into a walking vagina bomb. His plan is to use his prisoners as a distraction so Big Boss won't be at MSF to defend it from XOF, and use Paz as a failsafe to blow Big Boss away after the fact. The bomb that ultimately blows Paz and everyone in the kingdom shit is already in a place they'd never think to look and don't look. The surgery doesn't slow Big Boss down or distract him in any way. Morpho's still en route to MSF and they're still gonna be too late to stop its destruction with or without the surgery. And it isn't like Big Boss would immediately stop and go, okay, something's wrong, check your vagina, if there wasn't a first bomb that required cutting Paws open with horrific detail. So then what the fuck is the point of this scene? Why are we being subjected to the worst thing MGS has ever subjected its audience to then? Narratively, there's no actual reason for the first bomb to exist. If anything, it only risks fucking up Skullface's plan because his men actually had to remove organs from her body just to make room for the bomb. Anything could go wrong. What if she dies before Big Boss can save her? Then what? This scene is literally pointless. It exists just to shock you and say, look, look at this shit. See how dark it is? See how dark this game is? 
there's a difference between dark and juvenile and this shit is the latter. It exists purely for shock value. The laziest, most half ass reason to ever include scenes like this in the series not renowned for aggressive gore. If it's to establish what a bastard Skullface is, literally everything else he does establishes that just fine. A scene is supposed to do one of two things, either advance the plot in some way or another or expand on character. This does neither. Cut pauses surgery scene from the cutscenes and nothing is lost. The point is this, if you're going to take a normally campy and cheesy series and give it a gritty gory coat of paint then there damn well better be a reason for it. And the fact that there is no discernible reason for this scene to exist shows just what kind of writer Kujim Bob is. He's the kind of writer who wants to go dark for the sake of going dark, even if it comes at the detriment to the overall identity of the series. MGS has frustrated the hell out of me time and time again, but it's never left me feeling gross. Only unlike more competently written narratives that know how to get under your skin with purpose, this is done just for the sake of it. And it's a little jarring going from this... to this. <laughs> the same could be said for Chico's fourth tape, the infamous rape scene. This shit garnered a ton of criticism and controversy in 2014 when Ground Zeroes came out. The context is that Skullface wants to break Chico so he'll give up the intel he needs about MSF. So to do that, Skullface uses Paws and orders Chico, a 14-year-old boy, to rape her or else he gets strung up next. It can be interpreted that either Chico went along with it or Skullface had one of his men raping Paws instead. The end result leaves the kid broken and unable to look at Paws but gives Skullface exactly what he wants. We already have all the information we need to get what happened and let our imaginations take it from there. Boom. Then this happens. Move. Rape is something that unfortunately is much closer to home than gunning down rows of enemy combatants. So if you're going to subject viewers and players to something like that in a series that usually isn't renowned for such real, uncomfortable garbage, then again, there needs to be a point to it. The problem again is that hearing the actual rape, however brief, is completely redundant. We already have all the information we need to let our imaginations do the rest. You've already relayed the information, so hearing it happen is pure redundancy. This isn't taking Metal Gear to new, dark places. It's making a game that feels completely tone-deaf and at odds with itself. The real gritty, ugly reality completely juxtaposes the zombie cowboy at the heart of it all, and the goofy, stupid narrative that's led us up to this point. I mean, for fuck's sake, this is like G.I. Joe trying to handle crippling depression. Ground Zero shows that Kojima does know how to create real intrigue, and minus the rape tapes, some of Skullface's scenes on these cassettes are the best villain moments of any MGS game to date. Tell me where he is. Where is Cypher? Where is Zero? I've never known choice. Where I was born, the language I speak, I've never had the freedom to choose for myself. But you, right now, are free. Do as you will. The dialogue has an overall better feel to it, but as the opening proves, there's still a ton of room for improvement if Big Boss's dialogue is still mostly superfluous. The actual broad strokes of the setup are fine, but again, there's too little here to call it an actual journey. The whole of Ground Zeroes just feels like a giant case of blue balls. Not a full enough prologue to leave me actually satisfied, just annoyed that it took over a year and a half to get the rest of the game after getting its opening. And the fact that the subject matter is so grossly mishandled just turned me off to the entire thing. And that's a shame because so much of Ground Zeroes' production value is top notch. The soundtrack, for one, has a new lead composer in the form of newcomer Ludwig Forsell, a young Swedish composer who was largely an unknown before blowing up with notoriety after his masterful work with MGS5, and is gonna get even bigger after what's always shaping up to be an amazing soundtrack with Death Stranding. Forsell, along with Harry Gregson Williams, Akihiro Honda, and the usual sound bandits, all work together to construct a whole new kind of soundtrack for MGS5. Like many games these days, the aim is less about creating tracks with kick and more about setting a mood, once again taking a page out of Carpenter's book. The music works to let you know the situation at hand. If guards are suspicious, if certain scripted sequences have kicked in, whatever. It fits any given situation and has a really unique feel to it, particularly for MGS. Some tracks do sound a bit too droning and repetitive for my taste.
And some of them have that grand operatic tone that sounds nice, but feels like a lot of been there, done that. But then you have tracks like this. And holy shit, tracks like this. I cannot understate how much I adore the soundtrack of Metal Gear Solid 5. And while Ground Zero's soundtrack may not have a lot of tracks that I go out of my way to listen to on my own, the tracks that do stand out are some of the best in this series. And even the tracks that don't necessarily titillate me still excel at setting a mood perfectly. And while the script gives Kiefer Sutherland next to nothing of value to work with, the voice acting in Ground Zero's is fucking fantastic. Everyone, Sutherland included, has a much more naturalistic tone in their voice. He sounds a lot more in the moment than Hater tends to, out of breath and straining after climbing shit, assertive without feeling exaggerated. Contrary to most MGS games, no one sounds like a cartoon character. Even Skullface, the literal cartoon character of the bunch, has such a buttery smooth and cold tone to his voice, as he's played to perfection by veteran voice actor James Horan. You know, that 5-hour energy cowboy. Listen, 5-hour energy lasts a whole lot of hours, so you can get a lot done without refills. And it's packed with B vitamins and nutrients to make it last. So, don't just stand there holding your lattes, boys. Make your move. We'll take the five hour energy. But that kind of goes back to the problem, though, doesn't it? All of this excellent production value is in service of such a tonal clusterfuck that's too damn brief. Even if Saving Private McFiddler were playable as it should have been, it would still be too short lived an experience. And for the record, yes, Metal Gear can be dark. You can have really fucked up shit that gets under your skin and not lose your sense of identity, but Ground Zeroes is so damn short that establishing any sort of identity is impossible. So what we're left with is a snippet of gross, gritty misery that's certainly engaging, but feels like Metal Gear in name and name alone. And bear in mind, I say all of this as someone who doesn't even like the writing of the Metal Gear series. But graphic open stomach surgery and rape tapes are not better alternatives. In the end, I enjoy playing Ground Zeroes, but I'm frustrated by its mere existence. On one hand, it's the single best opening to any Metal Gear game to date. The gameplay is sublime, the level design of Camp Omega is incredible, the soundtrack, voice acting, and cutscene production value is top of the line, and it's a step in the right direction far as how to create intrigue without front-loading your game with exposition. But there is absolutely no justifying the price. Even the best mission of any stealth action game ever made wouldn't be worth $29.99, not even the current $19.99. Beyond that, the gross mishandling of sensitive subject matter kind of reinforces the point that maybe Kojimba should just stick with ghost arms. I enjoy Ground Zeroes, but I resent it just as much. I resent Konami for selling this fucking farce for any price beyond Subway Footlong, and I resent Kojima for his wildly inappropriate misuse of Taboo for pure shock value as opposed to anything that actually enhances the story. It's fun as hell, but the lack of variety in its levels makes all seven missions feel like slight variations of the same mission. The lack of a complete and satisfying three-act story basically makes the entire game feel like watching the first ten minutes of a highly anticipated blockbuster, then waiting a fucking year and a half for the rest of the film to come out. And while the overall experience may have succeeded in making me excited for MGS5, it also left me feeling incredibly ripped off. And so my final rating for Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes is a 5 out of 10. It was already at a deficit from the word go, and elevated only by its unmatched game design and incredible production value. But I'll be goddamned if I give a fucking demo I paid a week's worth of burgers for anything above that. Anyway, those are my frustrated, bewildering thoughts on this thing I hesitate to even call a video game. Whatever your thoughts, let me know in the comments. If you like this review, please clap. I mean, hit the subscribe button. Last on the agenda is a big one. Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Peen. Anyway, thanks for watching. Also, when he isn't shoving bombs in vaginas, Skullface likes to promote failing pizza chains. The bacon-wrapped deep, deep dish pizza is back at Little Caesars. But if you're wondering who would take it away in the first place, it was Chet Wallaby, Little Caesars' corporate scapegoat. I, Chet Wallaby, acted alone to take away your eight crispy caramelized corners of pizza wrapped in over three and a half feet of bacon. I deeply regret this decision that I made entirely on my own. The truth feels good, doesn't it, son?